。OK， 我就稍微搞定。Yeah. 那大哥有你，你就麻烦你前面三个好了，好吗？哦，可以啊，有有五个，前面三个啊，我后面两个，这样好吗？可以可以，没有问题。对，谢谢。OK， 等一下我们就准时开始了。好，所以等一下 Timothy 会让我们知道开始的时间，对吗？哎，对，我们就准时准时开始。好，新加坡时间中午十二点。我们现有没有现在已经在录影，对，已经在那个 recording 了哈。OK， 好，时间到已经开始。OK，OK，、okay. okay, 我们可以开始了吧？可以。好啊 ，Hello everyone, just like to thank you everybody for coming to join us for this Asia Pacific Society Cardiology Cloud Forum of Cardiovascular Disease Series. And this series, we have a lineup of excellent speakers to share with us very relevant topics. On the hunting precision targets in atrial fibrillation therapy, who, when, and how. We've got a series of speakers representing the different countries from、uh, Asia Pacific. For this series of sessions, we're really going to discuss that the atrial fibrillation has、uh, has the progress and on the knowledge of management of atrial fibrillation has made significant progress in the last、uh, five to ten years now, and especially with the introduction of、uh, wearable devices. Uh, cardiac implantable electronic devices, even machine learning, artificial intelligence, has also give us opportunity to not just clarify AF burden, but also the incidence and unprecedented risk of subclinical AF. Now we know that the restoration of sinus rhythm and maintenance of sinus rhythm for patients with atrial fibrillation is also important, and we will also discuss on the role of antiarrhythmic drug therapy,、uh, ablation technologies. And also, we discuss about left atrial appendage occluders, looking the role of、uh, prevention of strokes in this high risk cohort of patients who cannot tolerate oral anticoagulation. And we'll discuss the pitfalls of various therapies for both paroxysmal and persistent atrial fibrillation.、Uh, Abiyah,、um, introducing myself, I'm Colin. I'm from Singapore, and I'm working in、uh, Changi General Hospital, which is the eastern end of the of the country near the airport, and also.、Uh, Visit in the National Heart Center Singapore, and I'm very honored to have a co-chairman,、uh, Dr. Quan Ching Chang, from Taiwan, Taichung. He's the vice superintendent of the Department of Internal Medicine, Director Department of Medicine, China Medical University Hospital, Professor of Medicine, China Medical University.、Uh, a bit of a dis、uh, disclaimer and house rules: the content of this webinar is copyrighted by the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology and should not be distributed. Without the prior permission of APSC, the views and opinions expressed here are those of the faculty members, and they do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. Now, the good news is that the live streaming content of this webinar will also be made available via the APSC Cloud Facebook and YouTube page. So, with this, I'd like to introduce our first speaker from Vietnam, and he is Dr. Hong An Tien. Associate Professor, Vice President of Cardiovascular Center of Hue University Medicine and Pharmacy Hospital. He's also the Vice Head of the Cardiology Department of Hue University, Vietnam. He will be discussing on the stratification of subclinical atrial fibrillation by AF burden in wearable devices or cardiac implantable electronic monitoring targets of stroke prevention by oral anticoagulation. Dr. Hong, please. I guess so.、Uh, good afternoon, the chairman.、Uh, good afternoon, the、uh, audience. So、uh, today,、uh, I would like to present the topic: the stratification of、uh, subclinical atrial fibrillation by、uh, atrial fibrillation burden in wearable device or、uh, CF monitoring is target of、uh, stroke prevention by OAC.、Uh, so,、uh, as you know that. The use of a wearable device and cardiac implantic electronic device for detecting atrial high rate episodes, and their association with stroke risk and the use of anticoagulation for stroke prevention in patients with atrial high rate episodes have been subject for extensive research. And you know that the atrial high rate episodes,、uh, as known as subclinical atrial fibrillation, 
detected by the device is associated with increased risk of a shock at many uh, study. And uh, we raised the question that uh, how is the important of monitoring for detecting the subclinical atrial fibrillation. Uh, also at the use of uh, oral anticoagulation for reducing risk of stroke in patients with the uh, uh, device detect, uh, detected atrial fibrillation. And so uh, I wanted to talk about the epidemi epidemiology of atrial hydrase episodes and uh, subclinical atrial fibrillation. So the, uh, the incident uh, of the atrial high risk episodes and subclinical AF in patients with the pacemaker and implanted device E about around, uh, around 30 to 70 percent, but it may be lower in the grand range population. And about the very short episode is the below 10 to, uh, to 20 seconds per day are considered clinical irrelevance. And they are not significant associated with the longer episodes for increased risk of stroke or systemic embolism. However, the longer episodes of uh, astral uh, subclinical AF, a uh, minimum of uh, five to six minutes, are uh, associated with uh, increased risk of clinical atrial fibrillation, ischemic stroke, major adverse cardiovascular event, and cardiovascular death. So the overall, the absolute risk of stroke associated with atrial high risk episodes, subclinical AF, may be lower than with the clinical AF. And the temporal disassociation uh, from the acute stroke suggests that the atrial high risk episodes and subclinical AF may present a marker than a risk a factor or stroke. And so I would like to introduce the uh, study, uh, talk about the clinical device detected atrial fibrillation and stroke risk. Uh, this uh, study is a uh, systemic reviews and meta analysis. So the definition and cut, cut up of uh, detecting a subclinical atrial fibrillation uh, with the three device uh, by the Medtronic, by the SGM, by the Vitronic, and uh, its uh, vendor has the crit criteria for atrial high risk episodes, the criteria criteria for the cut up to recognize the clinical AF and also the criteria for duration of a subclinical AF, except for the stroke risk. So we can see that uh, three is the main vendor, uh, but uh, the crit uh, criteria is uh, uh, different from each other. And uh, with uh, the study, uh, they will uh, conclude, have a result that there is the association between the subclinical and uh, clinical atrial fibrillation. This means that uh, when in clinical, we uh, detect the subclinical AF and it can uh, lead to the uh, clinical atrial fibrillation uh, in the real life. So uh, the result is very uh, significant uh, with the B value is very, uh, very low. And the next uh, episode that uh, uh, the this study can find out the association between the subclinical atrial fibrillation and the stroke risk, and also the the uh, base value is very uh, significant. Uh, it means that uh, there's a strong strong uh, relationship between the subclinical atrial uh, atrial fibrillation and stroke. And uh, with uh, this uh, study, they can uh, they also uh, conclude that the atrial high risk episodes detect in the 30.9% in the patient annually. And the patient with the uh, atrial high risk episodes uh, have the 5.7 fold more like, to, more like to have a clinical atrial fibrillation. And, uh, and also very important uh, finding in this study that uh, they said that if the patient with the charge score is uh, uh, two and above is very well above a step. The current uh, threshold for anticoagulation to uh, prevent the shock. I think it's very uh, important finding of this study. And the next, I would like to introduce about the uh, 
ESC, European Society of Cardiology Guidelines, in uh, 2020 for diagnosis and management of uh, atrial fibrillation. And uh, with uh, this uh, guideline, uh, you know, we can see that uh, there is very uh, uh, clearly defined the definition of the AF and subclinical AF also at the, as the atrial high risk episodes. For example, uh, the atrial high risk episodes is defined by the uh, even full field program or specific criteria that detect by the cardiac uh, implant electronic device with the atrial lead allow automatic continuous monitoring of uh, atrial rhythm and tracing storage. Uh, so the CF recording uh, atrial high rate episodes need to be uh, visually inspected because some atrial high rate episodes may be electrical artifact and fable CT. And the definition of subclinical atrial fibrillation includes the atrial high rate episodes confirm that uh, AF and uh, atrial flutter or uh, atrial tachycardia or uh, atrial um, uh, fibrillation episodes detected by the acceptable cardiac monitoring or variable monitoring and confirmed by the visually revealed intracardiac electrogram or EKG record triton. And uh, so to define the device program uh, criteria for the atrial high risk episodes is above 175 bit per minute. And the criteria for atrial high risk episodes duration is uh, above the five uh, minute. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a very uh, important uh, definition uh, for the further investigation. And uh, you know that the, the atrial fibrillation as also the subclinical uh, atrial fibrillation has the same mechanism of the causing the stroke, causing the connective impairment, dysthermia, depression, hospitalization and mortality uh, due to the uh, pathophysiologist mechanism and uh, structural gibraling, uh, also, also the rapid ventricular rate, irregular heart rate, and loss of atrial systole. And there are similar the mechanism between the subclinical AF and uh, AF. And you know that uh, we have uh, a lot of the uh, instrument for the atrial fibrillation screening. Uh, for example, the method of uh, pulse talking, texting, the automatic uh, blood pressure monitor, the single lead uh, EKG, the smartphone app, and also the watch. And uh, the above the um, instrument uh, have the higher sensitivity and also high uh, specificity in uh, diagnosing the uh, AF, uh, also at the subclinical AF. And uh, you can see a lot of uh, the instrument, for example, the, the watch, the implantable cardiac monitor, and the, the pad for the one to week continuous monitor, the Altair and monitor, and also the, some uh, handheld EKG. And about the diagnosis of uh, atrial high risk episode and subclinical AF, the uh, continuous the, the cardiac implantic electric device with atrial lead can mon monitoring atrial rhythm and storage tracing. Uh, in this uh, figure, we see that uh, when the patient has uh, uh, no symptom, no previous diagnostic clinical AF, uh, and we use the CS GCOS device, and with the EKG, we can uh, confirm the AF. Uh, but uh, when the, the EKG, the normal EKG cannot find it, but the CF can uh, find out the EKG, so we can classify this as a subclinical AF. And uh, we also know that the, uh, we will still uh, lack of the information, lack of the study for the conclusion uh, about the, the evidence, uh, how we can treat with subclinical AF. And in Vietnam, we also have the guidelines about the uh, atrial fibrillation uh, of the Vietnamese Heart Association. Uh, it's uh, also the, the full uh, version and also the abstract version. And it also talks about the uh, subclinical AF, uh, also as the 
atrial high risk episode. So about the clinical implication of atrial high risk episodes and uh, subclinical atrial fibrillation. Uh, you know that uh, clinical AF yeah, you uh, reportedly developed in a one in a five to six patient and within the 2.5 years after diagnosis of atrial high risk episodes and subclinical AF. Yeah. And uh, even though the more high quality evidence need to inform to management of the patient, uh, the more intense follow-ups and monitor to detect clinical AF early is uh, prudent. And uh, notably, the atrial high risk episodes and subclinical AF burden is not static, but may change on daily basis. Uh, so uh, the higher risk uh, subsequent progress uh, to longer episodes. And whereas available evidence is uh, insufficient to uh, justify the routine oral anticoagulation uh, used in this uh, patient, uh, the modified uh, shock risk uh, factor should be identified and managed in each uh, patient. And we can also uh, see the um, uh, progression of uh, atrial high risk episode segment and uh, stroke rate according to the atrial high risk episode daily burden and short pass score. Uh, here's the six month Eastern uh, transients to the higher atrial high risk burden. And you, uh, you see that uh, in the patient uh, it, with the uh, atrial high risk episodes from uh, five to uh, one hour have uh, the uh, 30, uh, 30, uh, 3, 1, 5 percent chance to one hour. And when the patient has the uh, 12 to the 23 hour of the, the, the length of the atrial high risk uh, episodes, we will transcend to the segment uh, progression uh, to below to, to above uh, 23 hour is the very high risk with 63.1 percentage. And also the stroke rate in the atrial high risk uh, um, episodes burden and the sharp pass. We see that the intervention with the sharp pass score uh, larger. We have the higher of the incident of atrial fibrillation. And the recommended recommendation for the management of the patient of, of atrial high risk episodes uh, in the uh, LSC 2020, they said that uh, we should uh, complete uh, cardiovascular evaluation of EKG, uh, recording clinical risk fa factor, comorbidity evaluation, and thrombose embolysis are uh, assessed for sample sharp vascular. And we can uh, continue uh, patient follow up and monitoring, prefer with the support remote monitoring for detect progression of clinical AF and monitor the atrial high risk episodes burden. Uh, especially transcend to 24 hours to detect the chain uh, and detect the chain underlying clinical con conditions. And about the management of uh, atrial high risk episodes and uh, subclinical atrial fibrillation. And so the use of uh, oral anticoagulation may be considered if the patient with a longer duration of the atrial high risk episodes uh, above 24 hours and estimates a high individual risk of shock according to the anticipated clinical benefits and informed patient preferences. And in recent, uh, recently uh, trial, the oral anticipation were initiated in 76.4% and 56.3% of patients with uh, above clinical shock refresher, insertable cardiac monitoring, detect uh, physio confirmed AF for about six minutes, but uh, the follow-up leading rates were not report. And in last uh, retrospective cohort, using the remote monitoring data about the uh, AF burden, there's a large practice variation in the oral anticoagulation mission. So across the increasing uh, AF burden uh, SATA from the about six minutes to 24 hours, the risk of stroke in a chick patient is increased numerically and the strongest associated with the uh, oral anticoagulation with induced stroke and abscess of motivation with the body tech AF episodes for 24 hours above. And uh, so the guideline also proposed the management for the patient with the atrial high risk episodes and subclinical AF. Uh, so the patient with the uh, high risk due to the uh, sharp pass score uh, is about two uh, mark in the male 
and the three mark in the female and have the longer of the atrial high risk episode. For example, about one hour to 24 hour, about uh, 24 hour, we should consider to use oral anticoagulation in the selective patient with high and very high risk of stroke. Uh, for example, the patients uh, with age uh, both uh, 75 years old or just last uh, below the three mark, we can uh, should, uh, consider to use oral anticoagulation. So uh, we can uh, mention that uh, higher surface and longer atrial high risk episodes have the uh, suitable uh, to use oral anticoagulation. And uh, so uh, I will introduce uh, the new, newest um, tri trial that's uh, finished in the November in uh, 2023 uh, about the uh, about the non vitamin case antagonist oral antibiotic in patients with atrial hybrid episodes. Uh, it's the, from the study uh, NOAX and uh, AFNET. Uh, this the study, this the trial is the, um, also stopped due to the uh, safety and uh, futility. And two main outcomes is the uh, efficiency outcome, composites of cardiovascular, death, stroke, and systemic embolism for adosavant is not um, different to the principle. But the primary safety outcome, uh, composites on cause mortalities, uh, adosavant and placebo have a different uh, of the significance. So uh, this uh, trial is concluded that uh, adosabans uh, associated with the increase the primary safety outcome and driven uh, predominantly by more frequently major bleeding event. And the next, uh, and the, um, uh, with the trial, uh, we also have the, uh, the paper about the anti coalition with the adosabans in the patient with the atrial high risk episode. Uh, this also is very uh, uh, detailed about the clinical trial, but uh, but you know that the result uh, is not so um, so positive that the amount of patient with the atrial high risk episodes without atrial fibrillation, the incidence of composite cardiovascular death, stroke, and systemic embolism with endosabang has not significant different from the principle, and the treatment of endosabang lead to higher incidence of uh, composites that are measure of lithium. So uh, this uh, study uh, not, uh, have um, five nodes different in the uh, adosabang for uh, VS versus the placebo uh, in the patient with the atrial high rate episodes. And the next uh, trial is the abisabang for the reduction thromboembolism patient with the Vitec subclinical atrial fibrillation is the, the trial from the Astrasia. And this finding uh, have two uh, major outcome. The first outcome is the shock and systemic embolism. And, just, uh, and after the, this the trial, they conclude that uh, the, the rate, the difference in the patient use uh, Abisvang is uh, very significant compared to placebo group. And so, and with the uh, primary safety outcome, the measure of bleeding is also uh, different uh, from the placebo. Uh, so uh, they can conclude in this trial is the, the uh, abyssabang uh, will reduce the shock, uh, reduce the shock or systemic embolism. And so we need to balance the risk of the measure of bleeding compared to the aspirin. And also the there are the study, uh, the paper about the Apisvang for stroke prevention in subclinical atrial fibrillation. And uh, they conclude that among the patients with subclinical atrial fibrillation, Apisvang results in a lower risk of stroke or systemic embolism than aspirin, but the high risk of major bleeding. It's a very uh, important uh, conclusion of the, about the Apisvang. So Apisvang is uh, have a more positive results compared to the adosabang. So uh, with, the, uh, with the, the study and with the guidelines, uh, I can conclude uh, about the topic. 
that the uh, evidence suggests that the atrial high rate episodes detect by the wearable and uh, cardiac implantable electric device is associated with the uh, increased risk of stroke. And the stroke with the subclinical atrial fibrillation is at low compared to clinical areas and uh, could potentially represent a small burden. And the use of uh, oral anticoagulation therapies may be beneficial and reduce risk, uh, particularly in patients with a longer duration of atrial high risk episodes and high individual risk of stroke. Uh, Apisabang reserve is a low risk of stroke or systemic embolism than aspirin, but the higher risk for major bleeding due to the Australia trial 2023. And uh, endosabang was associated with the increase in primary safety outcome uh, with the trial NOAC agnostic trial 2023. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Huang, for your sharing. Um, is there anybody like to have any questions during the Q&A sessions? Oh, Dr. Chang, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Oh, very good. No, I, I have no question. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Huang, just was just uh, it's good. It's great that you get to share with us the two most recent trials uh, with subclinical atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation, uh, Artesia versus NOAA AFNet six, using two different direct oral anticoagulants, but uh, seemingly different outcomes. I mean, apixaban reduced embolic events at the price of bleeding. Edoxaban did not seem to reduce embolic events and still pay for the price of bleeding. The, what do you think is the reason for the difference? Do you think it's just the drug difference or is it the design or the trial or the criteria for AHRE that's different? Yes, uh, thank you for, uh, very much for your interesting question. Uh, so I, I think that the two news are uh, uh, recent from two trials. Uh, the first is uh, atrial is very uh, good for the participant that can reduce the risk of stroke and uh, systemic embolism. Uh, but in the trial uh, NOAA's uh, AFNES sick, the uh, Edosaban uh, not do the risk of a uh, shock. Uh, I think uh, uh, maybe it's the, you know that uh, the subclinical uh, AF is mean that uh, the atrial fibrillation does uh, detect by the device, by the CF, uh, cardiac implant, implant electric device is uh, similar to the, the AF, uh, but the uh, atrial high risk episodes, I think, is uh, because the criteria for a diagnosis of uh, atrial high risk episodes is different uh, from the, the the trial, and uh, so uh, is uh, we should uh, use the criteria of the European Society of uh, Cardiologists uh, two thousand and twenties uh, for the follow up and uh, evaluation the patient. And, and we it's the very uh, suitable if we devise two uh, two types. One is the subclinical AF detect by the uh, device, and another is the uh, atrial high risk episodes uh, detect by device. Because uh, I think the two types of uh, of um, the disease is uh, different from the morphologies of the the, the AF in the in the EKGs because the uh, atrial high rate episodes is uh, the the high rate of the the atrial phytum. Uh, I think that's uh, in the near future they will uh, stop. It, it means they will uh, um, have the more detail and more uh, specific group between the two group of uh, patient. Uh, and also we should uh, focus on the patient with the highest episode of atrial high rise uh, episodes, for example, uh, have the burden more than uh, 24 hours, for example, and we should uh, find the, the different and the, 
the efficiency efficiencies of uh, Erosa Bank, also Abyss Bank, in that station. Thank you very much. So uh, with this, we can go. We will go to the uh, second speaker. The second speaker is uh, Dr. Takafumi Oka from Japan. He is the assistant professor, Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, Osaka University, and also the EP chief doctor in Osaka University Hospital. His topic today will be choosing antiarrhythmic drugs first or catheter ablation as first strategy for recent onset AF management. And does AF burden matter? Thank you very much, Dr. Oka. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Takahumi Oka from Japan, Osaka University. I will share my presentation now. Can you see my presentation? Yes, it's good. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you, Chairperson. I'd like to thank the organizers to give me a chance to make presentation here. Today, I'll talk about the association between AF burden and treatment strategy. See you at this closure. This is the agenda of today's presentation. Let's start with section one, great progress in cast ablation for AF. Here, let's review the two famous RCTs 20 years ago. Both the, the AFIRM and the RACE studies compare the effectiveness of pharmacological rhythm control and rate control for AEF. We expected that maintenance of sinus rhythm by rhythm control would result in a better prognosis than rate control. However, there was no superiority in rhythm control. Sorry. The side effect of antiarrhythmic drugs, AAD, might impact on this result. The negative inotropic effect could exacerbate heart failure, and the proarrhythmic effect could cause bradyarrhythmia or fetal tachyarrhythmia, cancelling out the benefit of rhythm control. This is the limit of drug treatment. During the same period when a farm and race were being conducted, pulmonary vein isolation by caster ablation was invented. By electrically isolating the arrhythmic trigger in the PB with radio frequency ablation, maintenance of sinus rhythm could be achieved. The era of non-pharmacological therapy for AF has arrived. In the mantra path, RAFT-1 and RAFT-2 trials the effect of RFCA on PATH was compared with that of AAD. The result of that meta-analysis showed that RFCA was superior to AAD in terms of AF suppression. Abrasion has been recognized as the first-line therapy for PATH. The problem with RFCA was pulmonary vein reconnection in the chronic phase and there were the limitations in analyzing complex arrhythmia circuits of atrial tachyarrhythmia. However, with the evolution of contact force-guided RFCA and high-resolution 3D mapping systems, RFCA has made significant progress compared to before, and its efficacy and safety have improved. As RFCA had made progress, the introduction of cryovalon ablation, CBA, as a new ablation tool had a great impact on AF ablation. The fire and ice study proved that CBA had the same efficacy and safety as RFCA. CBA allows even beginners to perform durable PBI simply and reliably in a short time, and it has become widely popular. Very recently, pulse field ablation could be a game changer. In the advent study of 2023, the AF suppression effect of PFA and thermal ablation, such as RFCA and CBA, was compared and proven to be equivalent. PFA is likely to be able to perform durable ablation in a short time. 
and the PFA also may reduce collateral damage, which is a weakness of the thermal abrasion. Until now, the primary endpoint of RCTs has mainly been the AF recurrence, but attack trial and the castle AF trial investigating the impact of abrasion on CHF use a hard endpoint as a primary endpoint, such as all cause death, stroke, major bleeding, cardiac arrest. The Cabana trial, which examined the impact on prognosis between aberration and AAD for more than 2,000 people with symptomatic AF, is the largest scale trial. In the ITT analysis, there was no significant difference due to the high number of crossover from the AAD to aberration group. But the purpose for analysis showed the prognostic improvement in aberration group. The cast aberration may improve prognosis of AF patients. To summarize what we have learned from our CTs, first, aberration reduces AF burden more than AAD. Second, Aberration may improve prognosis of AF patient. While aberration seems beneficial, the question of whether we should recommend aberration to all AF patients is not that simple. The background of AF patients is miscellaneous. We recommend aberration in clinical practice considering these various factors. Today, I will focus on AF burden among them. Second section, does AF burden matter in AF treatment strategy? AF burden is defined as the amount of AF that an individual has. Classically, it is the AF type, paroxysmal, persistent, and long-standing persistent are easy to understand indicators but they are not suitable for uh, stratifying patients with a low AF burden. Recently, by using cardiac implantable electric devices, seeds, and long-term holter monitors, the proportion of AF duration to monitoring period expressed as a percentage has been used as AF burden. This is quantitative and reliable in patients with low AF burden. AF burden correlates with the AF progression. Generally, persistent AF is more advanced than uh, paroxysmal AF. After treatment such as AED, abrasion, and cardioversion, persistent AF has more recurrences than PAP. This is a sub-analysis of Kavana study about recurrence by AF type, PAP, and persistent AF. Blue represents AAD and red represents aberration. But both before and after intervention, the AF burden is clearly less in PATH and larger in persistent AF. In patient selection for RCTs, AF burden is an important item. Looking back at the uh, past RCTs, the efficacy and safety of new technologies are conducted on simple PATH cases. The beyond PBI studies are conducted on persistent AF cases. And the effectiveness of aberration for CHF is also conducted on persistent AF cases, which are greatly affected by AF burden. Recently, there has been a growing interest in Early rhythm control, ERC, for AF. This is a prognosis of gastric cancer. In the case of cancer with a poor prognosis, early treatment can significantly improve the prognosis. What about AF? It's not as poor a prognosis as cancer, but it can cause mortality, heart failure, and stroke. The East AFNet 4 in 2020 compared the early rhythm control, ERC, and rate control. Patients diagnosed with AF within one year were enrolled, and ERC was performed with either AAD or aberration. 
while user control was primary rate control. The prognosis was better with ERC, although ERC group has a low aberration rate of 20%. In 2021, an RCT comparing the effectiveness of CBA and AAD as the first three treatment for symptomatic and treated PAP was published at the same time. The primary endpoint was AF recurrence. Both showed good results with aberration. CBA works better than AAD for early PAP. Notably, in Early AF trial, recurrence was observed by implantable cardiac monitor. The true recurrence rate was unveiled. The symptomatic recurrence rate was 11% after the first vibration, but when combined with asymptomatic AF, hmm, asymptomatic AF, it was 43%, and the recurrence rate was 34% after multiple sessions. The mean AF burden did not differ. Thus, asymptomatic recurrence often occurs. In the long-term follow-up of early AF, it was found that performing CBA during the path could suppress the transition to persistent AF. Similar results by RFCA have been reported from Germany. The attest study showed that if RFCA is performed during PATH, it can prevent the transition to persistent AF compared to AAD. The suppression of disease progression was the merit of aberration for PATH at an early stage. Of course, some patients consult with PATH and others consult, consult with per persistent AF but it seems beneficial to perform early rhythm control. I wonder, the earlier the better, if we pursue ERC, an intervention at the point of very low AF burden, such as first diagnosed AF and the subclinical AF scalp. Let's review the impact of AF burden on prognosis. First, classically, when dividing patients by type of, uh, by type of AF, such as paroxysmal, persistent, and permanent, the longer the AF duration was, the more stroke occurred. There was a correlation between AF burden and prognosis. In the sub-analysis of East AF Net 4, the event rate was examined on the basis of the type of AF. In the group with a path, ERC significantly improved the prognosis, and a similar trend was observed in persistent AF. In this RCT, aberration was less, less at 20%. If more aberration were performed, the effectiveness of ERC might increase. Among the patients in HDSTF Net 4, 1,000 first episode AF patients were enrolled within seven days of their first visit. There was almost no difference in the effect of the intervention. It can be said that it is not too late to start treatment after observing the course of a course of a path for a while, rather than intervening immediately when the first episode AF is found. This paper examines the progression of the first episode of AF. Among the first episode AF, half experienced no recurrence in five years. Less than 20% showed the transition to persistent AF. Patients with no long AF showed AF progression, which suggests that AF high-risk groups with comorbid disease should be watched carefully. I'll also touch on SCAP, subclinical AF. Recently, thanks to SEED and wearable devices, intervention in SCAP has become a topic of discussion. SCAP is defined as a symptomatic AF that is only detected by SEED and wearable devices and is not captured by ECG. 
A lot of study investigated the association between scap and the CV events. Generally, high scap burden is associated with embryonic stroke. Furthermore, SCAP often progressed to symptomatic AFAT and was also related to the onset of CHL. The study examining the, uh, examining the, the efficacy and safety of drugs for SCAP was published in 2023. Apixaban demonstrated its effectiveness while Apixaban did not. Breeding events increased in the both studies. In the future, analysis will progress on patient groups where the benefit of drugs outweighs the risks when it comes to castration, which is more invasive. I think more stratification is necessary. In summary of early rhythm control for patients with a low AF burden. A burden was associated with cardiovascular event risk. However, risk and benefit of ERC should be considered in each patient. In section three, I will discuss which patient benefit from early rhythm control strategy. In the sub-analysis of East AF net four by the severity of symptom. The effect of ERC was more evident in case with severe symptoms. We should recommend ERC to symptomatic patients in order to improve their quality of life. This study showed a tendency for improved prognosis with ERC even in asymptomatic cases. In the Chad Basque specific analysis of East AFNet4, ERC improved the prognosis of the patients with high Chazbasku score. In those with low Chazbasku score, there was no difference. Since Chazbasku correlates with prognosis risk, ERC is recommended for patients with a high Chazbasku score. This is a result of code AF from South Korea, investigating the effect of abrasion on asymptomatic AF. Symptom was quantified by AFEQT score. Even in asymptomatic patients, if the, the CHAS score was high, there was an effect of improving prognosis, which is consistent with the sub-analysis of East AFNet. In the sub-analysis of East AFNet 4, based on the presence of heart failure, ERC was effective in case with heart failure. Analysis was added in HFREF at heart failure mid-range EF and HFREF cohorts, but no statistic diff significance was observed, possibly due to underpower. Because AF is a factor that exacerbates heart failure, early intervention is reasonable. In the sub-analysis of Kavana study by symptomatic CHF, aberration improved prognosis. Among 778 patients with CHF, median LBEF was 55%, and less than 10% of patients were HFREF. Since AADs have side effects which worsen the prognosis of patients with a heart failure, ablation may be optimal as ERC for CHF. I have presented about AF burden and ERC. The methods to detect AF have increased compared to before, and it is anticipated that situations requiring considering of ERC will increase in daily medical practice. This is my take home message. First, AF burden matters when we discuss the strategy for all AF patients. Second, AF burden symptom, Chazbask scores, and CHF should be considered in ERC. Third, we should carefully recommend ERC to patients with low AF burden. ERC must be a tailor-made therapy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Okawa. Thank you. Uh, I like it that you, you bring together 
uh, the different kinds of uh, low AF burden. Um, just wanted to ask, so you shared about who are the patients, you would, the benefits of early rhythm control. So I was wondering who are the patients you would not offer early rhythm control uh, if they have a newly diagnosed AFib or, or, or first onset of AFib. Oh, thank you. That's very good, very important point. I I don't agree with the notion that ERC should be recommended to all patients. I don't want to recommend ERC to patients with low risk, low risk, asymptomatic, low chart score, no symptom of CHF. I want to uh, recommend ERC to the high risk patient. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions from my co chair or anybody else? Uh, okay, just a short question. <laughs> uh, uh, very good presentation. You mentioned about uh, uh, you will use ERC in high risk uh, patient. Yeah. So uh, if patient with a high chest bus score, like uh, more than four, so the, uh, and he or she has a subclinical or uh, atrial high rate episode. So what about the duration? You will, you will consider uh, how long the duration you will initiate e ERC in this high risk patient. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I think the AF duration at more than uh, 24, 24 hours is associated with stroke risk in the previous report. So I recommend the, uh, more than one day, more than one day lasting AF is uh, harmful. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I think we can introduce our third speaker who's from Thailand, Dr. Ron Pichai. He is the uh, attending physician of cardiovascular medicine from King Chula Long Kong Memorial Hospital, Bangkok, Thailand. And today he's going to share with us on radio frequency catheter ablation, cryo ablation, or pulse field ablation for interventional pulmonary vein isolation in atrial fibrillation, efficacy comparison, and targets of choice. I think this is something that uh, many of us are uh, grappling with it now. So thank you very much, Dr. Ron Pichai. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, to uh, kindly introduce me and the topic that we're going to discuss this uh, afternoon. So let me, let me share my slide. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, let me start real quick. Okay, so the, to the topic, uh, we're gonna touch up the options available for the catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. As the prior speakers uh, discussed about the pros and cons between antiarrhythmic agent and ablation therapies. I think now we are going into the era of uh, very many options to do the pulmonary vein isolations. So the next 20 minutes, we're gonna touch up to about pros and cons between those different options. There's no doubt that a PV isolation is a cornerstone treatment of proxismal atrial fibrillation according to the ESC guideline and ACC guideline that just released in the past month. So basically every patient comes in with a FIF for ablation required to have the PVI as a minimum therapy. But the other ablation strategies, including the posterior wall isolation, cafe ablations, it's uncertain and it works put as the recommended guideline as a 2B class of indications. So we're gonna update about the PVI aspect first. Efficacy of the PVIs, as we know, it's all about the durability of the PVI. As long as you can maintain the PVI, it, it is associated with the lower risk of effect recurrence of the oblations. As we know that that still so far has not have any evidence to support other ablation strategies including triggers ablations, cafe ablations, and additional tests post-PVI did not confer any higher benefits 
than without testing after PV isolations. And the complications where it is uh, even getting lower and lower is, is in ignorable because cardiac tamponade, esophageal injury, specifically atrial esophageal fistula, or subsequent uh, proarrhythmic from ablation, which is a typical atrial flutter or PV stenosis, might have to be taken into the consideration when we pick up the ablation strategies for the patients. So it seems that we are going to the era that less is more still hold the truth when we are dealing with the first catheter ablation for the patients. We're gonna talk about the durability of the PVIs. What I mean by the durability of the PVI is we, the aim of the ablation catheter is just try to isolate all the PVs. And when we can isolate all the PVs, we can eliminate, it, eliminate air traffic ablations. However, about 30% of the patient in most of the cohorts has AFib recurrence, which is associated with, with what we call PV reconnection. So this is the, the picture that uh, demonstrates the concept of the PV isolation from the patients who come in for the RF ablation. The red dot line is the uh, area or the line that we apply the RF along the, the line that connect between the PV and the LA antrum. So the concept of the PV isolation is just try to prevent the electrical impulse from the pulmonary veins going to trigger the effect into the LA. Once we can isolate the veins, all four veins from the PVs, not allowing the electrical impulse from the PVs into the LA, then we believe that we can stop effect and can maintain the status flipping for the patients. However, the success rate is not 100% for the RF, including cryo balloon, as we might include both strategy as a thermal ablations, because a lot of patients experience what we call the PV reconnection. PV reconnection can be occur during the acute episodes or the long-term episodes. A lot of studies try to explain and try to and observe the correlation between the acute and the long-term PV reconnections. So this, this graph, you can see that we would not be surprised to see the PV reconnections because in the RF, you're gonna apply the single lesions as a contagious patterns. So there's the possibility that the patient might have the gap, which allow the connection between the PVs into the LA. And the studies also prove that the common area of the reconnection, either acute and long-term, is the area that's hard to ablate, including the carina, which is the area that is the joint area between the top and the bottom veins. So a lot of operators try to invent the technologies that try to isolate the veins at the same time. As you might see, the cryo balloon ablation strategies on the right and on the left. I would like to show the comparison between the good occlusion, which means after injected contrast into the tip of the cryo balloon catheter, you will see the contrast back leak into the upper branch of the pulmonary veins. This means that you get a very effective occlusion. And as soon as you see this fullaroscopy, you can apply the cold uh, temperature into the balloon and the, the cold freezing would takes about 180 to 240 seconds to freeze up and kill the chip tubes around the primary veins. However, if you look on the right side of the screen with the same memory system that we inject the contrast and you're gonna see the leak of the contrast out on the lateral part of the balloon. This means that you cannot get a good contact of the balloon on the PV ostlums. And if you apply the, the cold energy in this area, it's not going to work to isolate the veins. That's, that is the reason why a lot of effort try to invent the new technology and tool, including the instrument that try to isolate the veins in one shot, but it's still not going to be 100% success rate for the cray balloon. So trying to compare the two conventional approach for the catheter ablation for the PVIs, 
there are randomized studies that I'm gonna show you to test uh, the effective of the CRE balloon and the RF. There is the one to one randomized study uh, randomized the patient into the RF and the cryo balloon and the follow up the patients per protocol at four to six months by repeating mapping procedures comparing between the cryo balloon and the RF. This is the RF on the left. We're going to see the PV reconnected area. We can appreciate the difference between the RF and the cryo balloon in terms of the PV reconnection at six months. So the reconnection area in the RF group seems to be clustered around the crina area. However, in the cryo balloon group, the PV reconnection spot seems to be heterogeneity distributed along the PV ostium. With the efficacy for the uh, AFP free or the durability of the PVI, it seems to be pretty similarities between the RF and the cryo balloon because in 98 patients in this randomized studies, 81% versus 76% still have the PVIs from the cryo and RF respectively. So the efficacy of the cryo and RF seems to be pretty close to each other, but just different on the area of the PV rate connections. Here comes with the new technologies that will just wanna fill the gap in terms of the safety endpoint. The technology is called the pulse field ablations using the specialized energy from electrical field that selectively damage the tissue of interest, which is the myocardium from the left atrium. So the pulse field ablation technology preserve and avoid the collateral damage to the adjacent structure, including esophagus and phrenic nerve. So in theory, this pulse field ablation has a basic advantage over the thermal injury in terms of the safety by avoiding collateral damage to the adjacent structure namely esophagus and phrenic nerve. With the new technologies coming out in the past five or six years, a lot of studies try to explore the difficulties to master in the pulse field ablation. One of the studies that try to look into the learning curve by the operators, it seems that the procedure time is pretty short, about 80 minutes to complete the PVIs, but we observe a significant increase in the fluoroscopic time in the pulse field ablation group, about 20 minutes. However, in this pulse field ablation procedures, they were all done by the operator who are experienced in the thermal ablation procedures. And the first pass isolation achieved about 98%, which is pretty impressive compared to those prior conventional ablations. So I'm gonna focus on only three of uh, options available and which are the most popular now that they worldwide for the PV isolation. They, they are pulse field ablation, cryo balloon ablation, and RF. Uh, we are not going to talk about the optional energy source or catheter type like laser balloon in this uh, lectures. This is the meta analysis to compare the efficacies of the first pulse PV isolation. It seems that every single modality of the ablation, PFA, cryo, and RF, confer a very good result for the PVIs, ranging from 71% to 87%, which is not statistically significant from each other. But if you just look at the number roughly, you're going to see the pulse ablation seem to have the highest durability of the PVI in this meta-analysis. When comparing with these three options, the cryo balloon and RF have a similar performance on the durability of the PVIs, and the PFA has the highest durability rate when they follow up the patient at 12 months. However, with the statistical analysis, there is no significant difference between these three options. What about the safety when they claim that the first pulse view ablation came out and proved the concept to have the 0% of the esophageal injuries. In, the, 
in, in some studies in the past few years, because of the new technology, not just development in the field of the policy ablation, we have a lot of technology and strategies to mitigate the effect of the esophageal injuries. So one of the studies that I just want to pinpoint is show that esophageal fistula is about zero in almost 300 patients. The complication rates from these three different options is very low, which is ignorable complication rate in cardiac tamponade on positive ablation group. And here comes with the most recent randomized studies trying to compare the positive ablation to conventional thermal ablation. And the conventional thermal ablation could be either cryo-balloon ablation or RF, but based on the operator preference in particular centers. So this is a randomized single blind on inferiority, inferiority trials comparing the cryo-balloon for the PVIs in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. We can see the very close uh, Kaplan Meyer curve for the AF free survival at one year between the group with the positive ablation and thermal ablation as about 70%. So in this studies of the very big randomized studies, they, we can conclude that the positive ablation was non-inferior to the conventional thermal ablation, either cryo balloon and, R and RF. Here comes to uh, the, the, the point that when we are discussed about these three available options, we need to look from different lens before pick up each strategies for our patients. So let's start out with the efficacies. All of the randomized studies prove the similar efficacy between these three options by having the 70 to 75% AF free survival rate at one year between these three options. So I think the efficacy of these three options is pretty close to each other. And about a com complication rate, uh, now that we are going to what we call the near zero esophageal injury era, because atrial esophageal fistula is the most devastating complication for the RF ablation in the patient with AF. And from the pulse ablation, large cohort study uh, looking into 1,600 patients, they found a zero incidence of the esophageal in injury in the pulsory ablation. Also in the era of, in the past few years with the concept of the high power shot durations, we placed a catheter in a very short amount of time on each particular point in combination with the esophageal monitoring. The, incident, the incidence of the esophageal injury in the thermal ablation groups go even lower to lower until the it's approaching the zero. So I think with the patients in general population, we can say that it's a very close incident of esophageal injury compared to these three available options. And what about the operation time? Uh, the major area that I just want to pinpoint it is, is about a fluoroscopic time because we can do the zero fluoroscopic ablation in the RF by the assistance from the electroanatomical mapping under the 3D guided approach. So many PVIs have uh, undergone without a fluoroscopic assistance. Still, we need to use some uh, fluoroscopy during the crab balloon ablation by confirming the position of the balloon that it just abut on the PV art stems. We have to inject the contrast and look under the fluoroscopy to confirm the position of the balloon before apply the cold energy. But it just takes about two or three minutes for the whole procedures. The last thing, uh, but it's going to be even shorter over the period of time that I strongly believe because from the recent study, it takes about 15 to 17 minutes for the pulse field ablations. So compared to the uh, these points of view about the operation times, it seems to be pretty shorter for the whole procedural time for the pulse view ablation, but with a significant higher fluoroscopy exposure or radiation exposure to the operators with a pulse view ablation. And what about the learning curve? 
I think this is uh, the area that we cannot directly compare between these three available options because most of the centers that conduct the study about a pulse ablation were operated by very experienced operator that are very good at uh, catheter rescue in the RF and the cryo balloon. But it seems that it takes a very short learning curve to master the pulse reablation. What about the evidence? I think a lot of evidence prove the efficacy of safety for the thermal ablations. And a growing body of evidence will prove the concept of the pulse wheel ablation for the persistent AF in the future. Here it comes to my uh, personal opinion about how we select the patients suitable for each uh, particular ablation strategies. So I think if the patient comes in with a PVI, there's no much difference between these three available options. However, we, with the patients who are very uh, likely to have a typical flutters, and we try to avoid the extent, extensive ablation on that patient, RF might be preferable options to me. For the patient, it's gonna be very quick, fast. In the patient with pretty straightforward uh, anatomical for a PV, and a possible ablation is very, uh, recommended in the patient's profile that is prone to the atrioesophageal fistula, like a very small ladies or patients. And I think they are developing the catheter to perform like the RF energy. This is the reason why I mentioned about the preference when I see the patient with a typical atrial flutters and select the RF because this is an example of the patient who comes in for the atypical atrial flutter and persistent AF ablation after two prior ablations of AFF. And the presenting rhythm was atrial flutters. And we mapped the atrial flutters, it's the micro reentry on the lower posterior wall. And as soon as the first burn comes in, we terminate the atrial flutters and no more flutter could be induced in that procedures of index. And we call it a day because it's success and the patient has to be AF and flutter free for one and a half year. So this is the point that I think is very important to, to, to focus uh, about trying to avoid extensive ablation in the patient with an extensive scar because we hit about the atrial cardiomyopathy and atrial stunning. The topic that I cannot cover in this uh, lecture is about new technologies that are trying to in, be invented to fill the gap uh, in terms of the safety and efficacy, including the high-intensity focused ultrasound and the high light -like laser ablation system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ron Pichai. Very nice uh, summary of the three prevailing technologies. Dr. Chang, any questions you'd like to ask? Uh, no. So, um, how, how have you have you personally started uh, using PFA in Thailand now? No, not yet. Uh, but we, we use a lot of uh, RF, mainly we, I can call RF based ablation. But uh, my experience with a uh, career balloon and a uh, good friends of mine from Singapore, I know that Singapore, they, they use uh, also like ECPC stuff, including Hong Kong, uh, just went back from the APHRS and uh, have a chance to discuss with a, a friends of mine. They said, if you are very master in the career balloon, the possible ablation is going to be pretty identical to the career balloon. Uh, but the in Thailand we have about the reimbursement uh, issues and any new technologies. I wouldn't expect to have a chance to uh, do the pulse wheel ablation by my own in the next one or two years. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. Uh, this this is really sensitive to individual countries' healthcare system and the reimbursement, and this is definitely a technology that is not cheap. Right. Okay. Okay, Chairman, just a short question. Uh, for the speaker, you you mentioned about you prefer 
using PFA in some high risk patient. So what what are the high risk patient you you mentioned? Yeah, I think all of us as the the ablationist hit esophageal fistula because if the ablation and uh we, uh every single patient who comes in with the clinical profile that put them at the very high risk of the AE fistula, like a very small lady, um, old ladies uh, who is a very frail, which is supposed to have very small amount of the fat between esophagus and the left atrium. And you, you can see the evidence when we do the RF with the esophageal probe in this kind of the patients. As soon as you turn the RF on, and the probe will beeping up, alerting about the shooting up the, the temperatures. So I think select the patients with this clinical profile for a PFA gonna be a good option. And I know that the uh, the vendors specific they are trying to develop the the two in one catheters that we they can use alternating between the RF and uh pulse field at the same time. But I think it's still under the experiment. Uh, hopefully, it will come out in the next few years. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so next move to the uh, fourth presentation by uh, Dr. Pen Xiu Huang from Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Huang is a clinical lecturer uh, in college, in medical college. Uh, National Taiwan University. Uh, he also is a attending physician uh, in cardiology of uh, National Taiwan University Yunnan branch. Uh, the title of his uh, presentation today is Artificial Intelligence Enables Sinus ECG in Prediction of Incident Atrial Fibrillation, Current and the Near Future. Uh, Dr. Huang, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for Professor Zhang's well kindness introductions, and let me share my screen first. Okay. So can everyone see my presentation slide? No, no problem. Okay. Thank you. So I'm Bang Suo Huang from National Taiwan University Yunlin Branch in the Central Taiwan, also near Taichung. And today my topic is the artificial intelligence AI enable sinus ECG in the prediction of the incident atrial fibrillations. As we know, uh, artificial intelligence is play very important roles in the medicine in other areas, and also recently in the cardiology field, especially in the EP field. I think the artificial intelligence will play a very, very important rules, but we also in the cross rules, we need to know how AI will guide us or how AI can help us to do the personalized medicine. It's very interesting and also very important targets. So before I start my today's presentations, as we know from the 2020 ESC guidelines, the clinical atrial fibrillations should be documented by the service ECG, either by the single lead ECG document atrial fibrillations reason more than 30 seconds or an entire complete EKGs. And how about this year's ACCH guidelines? There is a very special or specific target in the appendix of these guidelines. It indicates Artificial intelligence should may be in the atrial fibrillation management, maybe have its rules. The artificial intelligence can potentially use to better tailor therapy to the individual pa patients, like the personalized medicine. But this is focused on the atrial fibrillation management. But our today's topic is can sinus ECG predict the future atrial fibrillation events or can predict the future atrial fibrillation disease. So this is today's my outlines. I will first brief 
introduction, current knowledge about the artificial intelligence and the, maybe the rationale of the using AI to predict the future actual relations. Then I select the three representative studies, all published in the well-known and the very excellent cardiac journals. Uh, these studies, and I will briefly introduce this study to all the audience. And later, I will make some small conclusions. And maybe later in the panel discussions, our experts can give us some important or very educational comments. First introductions. Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia we all know. And uh, why we concern? Because early identification of the atrial fibrillation may lead to the early treatments of atrial fibrillation. And later, we can prevent atrial fibrillation related stroke and other comorbidities. As we know, atrial fibrillation is very popular and uh, it affects more than 40 million people around the world. And the incident rate is increasing year by year. Also, besides the atrial fibrillation in these tables, the hospital rates about 10 years ago, overweight, heart failure, and the myocardial infarctions, it indicates the atrial fibrillation prevents incidence, and also the comorbidity management is very important. And to put it, to be back, if we can early detect or even early predict the atrial fibrillation, maybe we can do some work to prevent it happens. So till now, how can we detect the atrial fibrillation? Maybe we can use the menu pass for patients, or we can use it for this possible or symptomatic patients, like the symptom of palpitations. We can use in the complete EKG to make a diagnosis of atrial fibrillations. If the ECG cannot confirm our suspicions, we can extend the monitor period, like using the 24 hours ambulatory ECG, event recorder, or even the root recorder to detect the possible atrial fibrillation presentation. And uh, as we know, the wearable device is well prevalent. So from the Apple Heart study, or the using the Huawei watch, the MAFA2 studies, all published four years ago in the NEJM and the JEC, it says for these possible patients or symptomatic patients, the possible arrhythmia later further confirmed is the atrial fibrillation. The possible preview rate from this wearable device can up to 0.84 or even 0.92 for those high risk or symptomatic patients. So till now, how can we detect or how can we diagnose atrial fibrillation? We need the evidence. The evidence is the service ECG or the halter or the loop recorder or even by the suspicions of the wearable devices. So let me think about the AI. How can AI play a role in the predict the age of relations? There is a movie clip from the when oh. Look at me. Positive for Howard Marks. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks and Donald Dubin that was take place today, April 22nd, at 0800 hours and four minutes. No. So, from these movies acted by the Tom Cruise, the minority reports, is play a cup in the futures. The cup can using a single device to detect or predict the future criminal events and before the criminal commit is will, uh, the cop can arrest the, pay, the, arrest the criminal. So the disease maybe can, fibrillations can be controlled before the event is even convened. Like, like the, this topic want to do, like the, this patient is only document with a normal science reason ECG, but can we use the normal science ECGs to detect or predict the future events of the atrial fibrillation? I think this is maybe the more important part of this today's topic. So let me re 
a brief introduce to the AI. The AI is a technique to enable machine to mimic human behavior. Under the AI substantials, there is a subset called the machine learning. The machine learning is the subset of the AI technique, which uses static method to enable machine to improve their experience. And also the subset of the machine learning or the AI is the deep learning. Deep learning is like the making the computation using the multi-layer neural network, like our brain network doing this. So let me use this figure to describe. The, up, the top is the machine learning models. We Maybe we can put an image like the dog image and we choose more important features like the dog have um, uh, one mouth, two eggs, four legs, one tail, something. And the list features, we label these important features. Then we using the machine to do the classifications. And after the machine classification or computations, we will have some scores and to differentiate this image is dog or not dog. So how about deep learning? Deep learning is combined the feature extraction and the classifications. Because from the machine learning, human or we give the computer the specific features, we think the most important features. But in the deep learning models, the computer or the machine will extract the features doing by themselves. They will decide which features is more important than others and putting it more higher weight to calculating the results. Then we will know, okay, the input is dog or not dog. So how about the challenge in the AF predictions? So we think the atrial arrhythmia is come from some structure changes before the atrial arrhythmia developed. So previous studies almost work on the like the P wave or a PI interval changes uh, compared with the atrial fibrillation patient and the others to detect which which least normal science reason ECGs, which one we or least patients will develop atrial fibrillation later, which one we are not develop atrial fibrillation later. So uh, before our topic today, previous risk scores like the Freeman Eric Charge AF or the Japanese Simple Risk Score like the Taiwan AF scores, we choosing some clinical or ECG factors and using that factors to choose uh, scores. And after the scores, we differentiate the higher risk to developing maybe five year seven year or 10 year risk of high risk of atrial fibrillation patients. All these models can only achieve 0.75 to 0.78 accuracies. And only the Freeman score and the charge AF scores incorporate some ECG factors like the PI interval or the LVH, etc. So let me introduce recent studies about the AI in the normal science reason to predict the future atrial fibrillations. Before we start, we using these simple illustrations to describe about the deep learning models. First, the input layer is we, we input the images into the computation process. Then we using the CNN model or other models to process these images and uh, they will decide which feature is more important and using these features to calculate the output, the results. And the result will be normal or abnormal. But besides we using the CNN, this process layers, maybe we can use the freighting layers. This freighting layer like the clinical risk factor, like we can also put into the age, sex, and uh, the other disease conditions, comorbidities into calculations. We think more information may be making our prediction more accuracy. So this is a very simple illustration about the deep learning models. So from this Mayo Clinic's very well-known studies is published four years ago in the Lancet. It's using the CNN model as their deep learning models. And they incorporate uh, one, one, 
and so 180,000 patients and using more than 650 normal size, thousand normal size ECGs. And it can achieve the prediction power of AUC more than 8.7. And uh, under the, the using more data, the extending data improvements, the AUC even can reach up to the point 90s. And uh, in this study, it points out that illustrate that using the AI enables the normal size ECGs, maybe we can predict the future atrial fibrillation events. And uh, using these deep learning models, the choosing which, which images or which data we use is very important. So let me use these figures to describe. For upper is the patients grouped into the no atrial fibrillation groups. They under during the medical records or all available ECG data, no atrial arrhythmia, no atrial fibrillation, no atrial flutter detected. So the index ECG is the first time ever known ECG available. And until all the follow-up periods, all the ECGs will incorporate into the window of the interest. And the more important is for those atrial fibrillation group patients. The index ECG is the first ever known, ever diagnosis atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter ECGs. Because our hypothesis is atrial fibrillation is developed due to the atrial arrhythmia or the cardiomyopathy, something. So we think the development of the cardiomyopathy or the ECG changes may be only precede the index ECG atrial fibrillation diagnosis before within one month. So the time of the interest or window of the interest is the ever index document atrial fibrillation ECGs before within one month, within one month. And the later during all the follow-up period, all the data will incorporate into the analysis. So uh, the blue, the blue line is the using only the primary analysis, is using only the first one ever known normal size ECGs within the index window of interest, like the index ECG uh, within one month, the ever first ECGs. And the, the red line is the incorporates not only the first one, but only the second and the third ECG before the atrial fibrillation diagnosis, all incorporated into calculations. As we know, more data and the more ECGs, we can get the better accuracy. So we can making the prediction power from the 0.87 to the 0.90s. And the second studies is published in the circulations and the, from the uh, group in the Penisavias is using more even bigger database is using 1.6 million ECG tracings from the 430,000 patients and uh, using the deep learning model to training it also can also yield 0 0.85 AUCs and it's very it's very good results and uh, this study very interesting is also trying using the ECG, normal science ECG, to predict the future's atrial fibrillation-related strokes. It, can, it also can give the prediction power more than 62%, 62%. And this is another interesting of these studies. It compare three different models. The gray one is only using the age and the six no ECG, no ECGs to using, put into the deep learning models and to see whether H and 6 can predict the future atrial fibrillation events. And the, the orange line is using only the ECG tracings. And the, the blue line is using the ECG tracing and the, also clinical information, H and the 6. We can know for all the people or the labels normal or abnormal ECG peoples, uh, more information we get, uh, more higher accuracy we can get. So the ECG tracings, we can get the accuracy about 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.83, 0.
but if after we incorporate ECG, H, and 6, we can achieve 0.84 accuracy. So this study is also using the DNN train models and compare with the previous, as we know, the, predict, the traditional predict atrial fibrillation events risk score, like the Charge AF, Eric, or Freeman Heart studies. All these traditional risk scores can only achieve the accuracy about 0.77. But in the DNN train models, we can get the accuracy up to 0.85. So this is the recent two years using the CNN model or deep learning model to predict the future AF. How about the machine learning? This is the study from the Japanese and it incorporate only the uh, 13,000 sinus recent ECGs and the, using the machine learning model, random forest algorithms. And uh, using these parameters, they think all the, maybe the QF, T wave, R wave, QIs, all the segments of the ECG, all of the segment of the ECGs can predict or can contribute the futures atrial fibrillation prediction powers. So these machine learning models can achieve the prediction accuracy up to 0 0.999, 0 0.999. So in summary, I cite uh, I using the list three least four years, the three very important models using the AI predict the using the AI and the normal science ECG to predict the futures atrial fibrillations. The CNN and DNN model can get the accuracy more than 0.85. And if you using the machine learning model, maybe we can get the more better accuracies. So ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, the maybe the futures can be seen. The fibrillation maybe can be controlled before the event is ever committed using the AI models. But but the basic hypothesis is that we think the atrial fibrillations develop. There is some structure, the myocardium or the cardiac structure changes before the atrial fibrillation attack detected or developed. So. We using the ECG features like the P interval P or the STQIs somehow. The difference between the normal science group and the atrial fibrillation, there may be some difference. And then we try to detect the tiny difference to, to see whether we can detect the future atrial fibrillation events. But for this studies, the key limitation is the currently as we know, the deep learning models, because the machine itself to pick up which features is more important, not like the machine learning models, we give the machines, okay, which features is more important. So the uh, AI studies or the CNN, DNN related neural network studies is lacking the explainabilities because we, we cannot know. We cannot know which features is more important, because the feature importance maybe this is a trait or this is a hint tell us. Okay, maybe for some changes is more important to leading the atrial fibrillations develop or patient will suffer from the atrial fibrillation more, and this is also the limitations for these studies. We need a very very large cohort we need a large database to do the training validations. And also we need to refine the data because maybe we, we still don't know the race can also play any difference in this ECGs or the AF prediction or developments. And besides as the study in the circulations, can we also combine not only using the normal science ECGs, if we combine more information like the age, gender, or other clinical features or biomarkers, can more advance or refine our AI models to predict the future atrial fibrillations. And uh, more important is computer. If we want to use computers to involve in our patient management, it's very important, but it's also very dangerous. So this all models should be supervised by the human beings. 
And uh, the future study or the far studies, maybe in the AI models, not only in the predict the future attribute relations, maybe we can pull back. We can using the AI model, using the normal size ECG to pick up more higher risk patients. Maybe they have the high risk to develop future atrial fibrillations. And these patients, like the previous speaker says, maybe for these higher risk patients, maybe for the stroke preventions, maybe we can consider using the anti copula not the anti -pyrrhetis. And also, if for these high risk patients, or now, we cannot make the diagnosis of atrial fibrillations, but maybe we can encourage these patients or these people to undergo the long-term cardiac monitoring, like the Holter event recorder, loop recorder, or even the Apple Watch to monitor the possible atrial fibrillation events. And also for these patients, as we know, the Atrial fibrillation measurement is we endorse the ABC pathways. So for these patients, maybe the comorbidity control, maybe for these patients, we can do more about the comorbidity controls. So ladies and gentlemen, let me make the conclusion of today's topics. I think the atrial fibrillation is frequently asthmatic. We need the prolonged cardio monitoring to making the sure or the final diagnosis of the atrial arrhythmia or atrial fibrillations. Sometimes this is low yield and very costly. And uh, besides these patients need more intensive monitoring and the measurements, even not the disease itself, but also the comorbidity and the mobility, mortality, monitoring and the controls. So using the AI models, maybe can provide these questions some solutions, like we can get these patients better patient solutions for the long-term monitoring using the AI or other devices. And also using these models, maybe we can design some clinical trials to start anticoagulations for those high, very, very high risk for the future ejaculation uh, victims. Mm, this is today's my topic, and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Huang, for your excellent presentation uh, of reviewing AI in prediction of uh, future atrial fibrillation. Uh, any question or question, comment? So, Dr. Huang, you mentioned that uh, of course, if we incorporate more data into the AI model, it could be more accurate. But yeah. uh, uh, do you think about uh, if you use more data, and uh, then the model actually is uh, somewhat hard to apply because you need, when you want to use the, the model, you need to collect mm -hmm. a lot of the data. Yeah, thank you, Professor Zhang. Like we try to find the criminals, more information we get, we can have a higher probability or higher confidence for the criminal convenience. So in this circulation models, so they like only using the age, sex, and the ECGs. Maybe we can choose more important, but easy to get information. And uh, to using incorporate these factors into calculations or into considerations. I think more information we can make in higher confidence, but which factors should be put into the models? We should balance the, the accessibility and also the predict powers. Yeah, I think this is very important. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Huang. If there is no uh, more question, uh, let's move to the final uh, presentation by uh, Dr. Uh, Bobby Singh from India. Uh, Dr. Singh uh, is now chairman and the head of cardiology at Penn Max Hospital uh, in India. Uh, the title of his presentation today is that atrial appendage occluder in prevention of thromboembolic stroke in coronary atrial fibrillation resistant or liable to OAC. 
target candidates and the long term efficacy. Uh, Dr. Singh, please. Thank you very much. Uh, can I share my? Sure. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Sure. So I'll share my screen and um, I will uh, present my slides. Not able to share. Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay, let me try to share again. Not able to connect. I don't know how to do it. I'm pressing share screen and then basic. Uh, Did you select board. the screen you like to share? Yeah, I selected. It's not coming. Now I'm the screen that I want to share. Yes. Can you see it? Oh, it's coming. Okay, thank you. So let's look at LA de device closure for atrial fibrillation in stroke prevention. Where are we now? That is the major question that have we reached a stage where we can say this therapy is there for um, many patients. So if we go back to the year 1969, that is the time of interest in atrial thrombosis and systemic, systemic embolism actually came. And this was a necros autopsy material where patients who had a systemic embolism or a stroke were studied and the left atriums were examined and it was seen that many patients with atrial fibrillation had clots in the left atrium which was probably responsible for the embolism so that was the first chapter in the history of stroke and atrial fibrillation was actually written several years later when transesophageal echo came into being, it was clear that left atrial thromb thrombus was a very important factor in patients with acute and chronic fibrillation. And uh, many patients with a recent embolic event had a, a left atrial appendage thrombus. So the conclusion at that stage was that left atrial appendage, which has very low blood flow in atrial fibrillation, is the main reason for clot formation and embolism. So from 69, we went on to 1995, when T was first introduced to understand actually that the left atrium is a very important structure in atrial fibrillation. You can see many studies put together, 91% of all uh, thrombi are in the left atrial appendage in patients who have atrial fibrillation. But this is true for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. For valvular rheumatic, even the body contributes a lot to thrombosis. So in non-valvular atrial fibrillation, you can see multiple studies put together show that left atrium has a very low chance of having a clot. It is the appendage, which majority of the times, 91% of the times, will have a clot. So that is the main area of focus because... Um, we now understand majority of clots in non malvular atrial fibrillation embolize from the left atrial appendage. But we can't forget that rheumatic and other etiologies may have a thrombus in the left atrium itself. If uh, we went from uh, 95 multiple studies showing the benefit of oral anticoagulation 
initially warfarin and now the Novax has been the therapeutic mainstay for stroke prophylaxis in atrial fibrillation. So undoubtedly, this therapy is there to stay, has shown outstanding benefits in patients with atrial fibrillation. And Novax have now become the treatment of choice because of their uh, safety profile, because of their uh, food to drug interaction, and also the lack of doing INR. So they have become the mainstay of treatment for patients with stroke prevention. However, anticoagulation may not always be possible because of personal history of bleeding. The risk of bleeding, particularly with elderly and uh, frail people who, who may fall or who have cerebral amyloid angiopathy or have severe hypertension, the risk of these people having a bleed is very high. Particularly, guidelines do not are quiet on people who are 85 age and above. What should be the best and anticoagulation therapy. Most of the trials had excluded this age group of patients. So anticoagulation may not be possible in all patients because of uh, history of bleeding, history of risk of bleeding, high risk occupations or documented non-compliance. Some people do not want to take oral anticoagulants. As a result, anticoagulants are not utilized or not maintained in 50% of the cases. So 50% of the cases will end up having no anticoagulation whatsoever. So the concept was that the appendage is the main area for source for thros uh, thrombus formation. This led to development of LA appendage closure devices, which led to some pivotal trials. And these pivotal trials had positive results. And this led to uh, many uh, centers adapting this form of therapy of LA appendage closure. As a result, you can see the rising numbers in the America of LA appendage closure uh, devices. The first device was the PLATO, and this led to a international multi-center feasibility trials. So this was the first device which was used to close the appendage. And uh, the good thing about it was the success with which it could be implanted, with success rates of 97.3%. Uh, so it was first time thought that this is feasible, can be performed at an acceptable risk, and is a good alternative in patients who have contraindication for anticoagulation. So this was a study published in 2005. This led to three randomized trials. So without randomized trial, we, we just cannot defy a therapy which could have potential complications and could also lead to systemic embolism later on. So we had to have some randomized trial and we have now three large randomized trials. You can see the PROTECT-AF prevail and the PROC-17. So PROTECT-AF was in about 700 patients, 460 in the device arm, 244 in the control arm. PREVAIL had uh, 269 in the device arm and 139. PROG had a device which could be an Amplance device or a Watchman device and a control group with 201 patients uh, on uh, anticoagulation. So in these two trials, it was the Watchman which was used and you could see the primary safety endpoints were met. The embolism and the stroke risk were similar. So it proved non-inferior. So we went on to have a meta-analysis of protect and prevail. And if you see this, you would see the efficacy almost similar. But the most important thing is the hemorrhagic strokes were reduced remarkably by having a, a watchman device. Uh, but it was in comparison to warfarin. So what if it was a NOAC instead of warfarin, would the hemorrhagic stroke would have been, uh, this this spot may have been on the uh, on one, could it be possible? 
But if you see systemic embolism or ischemic strokes were a little higher in the group. And this major reason was the first seven days uh, procedure related complication will lead to this problem. And now we're getting more experience with this device use. This has come down. All cause death, you can see favor of a watchman. Major bleeds, almost same. And major bleeds post-procedure. That means if you take out first seven days, post-procedure, the, the debates were less. So as we grow in experience, the major bleeds related to procedure or ischemic strokes related to procedure have come down significantly, resulting in uh, this data being skewed now. However, if you look at uh, the guidelines, the last we had was 2020 of uh, on use of LA appendage closure devices still continue to call it 2B. Probably they want to wait for some more trials. But they in, write, in addition, they write uh, that if there are contrary indications such as intracranial bleed without a reversible cause or very life-threatening bleeds, one should resort to LA appendage closure. Now we have so many... Uh, trials which are going on, which is uh, with large number of patients. And this would actually uh, be very important for us, for guidelines to understand what's going on. And you can see a large number of trial size, 3,000 patients, 2,600 patients. This is comparing uh, LA appendage closure with Watchman FLX, which is the new device from Watchman, compared against DUAC. So most of the trials are comparing against DUAC. You're comparing Amulet versus DUAC any of the device versus DUAC. Um, so BK or versus DUAC here. And uh, so you can see stroke close in patients who have intracranial hemorrhage, LA appendage with amulet device versus medical therapy, which does not include an oral anticoagulant. Uh, so intracranial hemorrhage is clearly one indication. And uh, these two trials are going to address this. Then is the compare LA appendage. So flex or amulet versus antiplatelets or no therapy in patients who have a contraindication to the oh, no ax. So the question was that patients have a contraindication. Uh, still, they may not have that high risk. So this was the question, and this is going to address that. So you can see a lot of things happening in the near future and over the next two to five years. We'll get results from many of these trials, and that is going to be the basis of what guidelines could change in favor of an appendage closure. Appendage closure has some issues. One is a device-related thrombus. So there are published reports of device-related thrombus, and there are clinical characteristics, procedural factors, post-procedure treatment, whether it's OVAC or three months of anticoagulation, all that are there. But this is rare complication. This is seen in 3.5% of the patients. But the issue is that if somebody has a device-related thrombus, there is a chance of embolization, and they may need a short-term anticoagulation. The dose may be less. Then there is a peri device leak. For example, this is a watchman device placed here. There is edge is not coaxial and not closing this part of the appendage, and there could be leak. So this is a procedural effect which can be actually corrected. Or there could be a, a lobe of the appendage which may not be in contact with the watchman device. So one has to be careful in picking up bigger size and if there is a lobe here. Similarly, there could be a, a a, 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 a lobe which is not at all in the appendage. It's coming separately in, from the LA and this could another be another issue. So, but these are all procedural issues which can be sorted out. So, But the problem is that we should be aware of this. If we leave a peri-device leak, they have a higher incidence of stroke or systemic embolism. That means we have been learning. Over the last few years, we have been learning how to place these devices, how to get the best results. And this is one of the reasons that uh, uh, this device is now being used more often because it has become much safer. We've understood how to deploy it. Now, 3D computer modeling of CT scan images can also help choose the devices, look at different lobes, decide where exactly you have to place, and may also be another beneficial effect. Like we do TAVI, we do a 3D uh, CT. So uh, LA appendage closure may need a, a CT with a 3D modeling to actually understand what size of device we may use. So there are large registry. This is a registry of 40,000 patients from the, um, uh, which is the Lao registry group, which clearly shows procedure success, which is very high, 99.3% compared to many of the trials. So evolution and uh, 
uh, allowed registry have similar, and the major complications were uh, uh, mainly pericardial infusion, which required um, synthesis in 1.3% of the patient, which still continues to bother us. Then others are very small incidences. So if you look at in this registry, when was a device chosen? The chosen device was when there was increased thromboembolic risk of stroke. That means the, the chats vas score was very high and patient had a TI or a minor stroke despite oral anticoagulation. This was one indication. History of major bleed was another indication why a, a LA appendage closure device was chosen. High fall risk, particularly in the very elderly, and uh, anticoagulant can be very difficult to choose, was another incident. So you can see 2016, 17, 18 practically remain the same. Labile INR is less of an issue with no ads available. Patient preference, one, of the, one third of the patients actually prefer to get a, uh, a LA appendage closure when they were discussed with as compared to oral anticoagulation. And non-compliance with anticoagulation was one indication. So you can see the indications of uh, in this registry with 38,000 patients, how the physicians felt and how the patients felt about the need of this device. And thank you very much for your kind attention. I can answer any questions if they're possible. Okay, thank you very much, Professor uh, Singh. Uh, any question? Oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Singh, uh, what do you think if a uh, uh, patient also need a uh, caster operation for atrial fibrillation and also need for uh, LAAO? Do you uh, prefer performing the procedure in a one-step, one-stop procedure or uh, sequentially? Okay. If it is the first ablation, I would like to avoid it because of the simple reason that he may need a second procedure and an appendage closure device, particularly an amplage device, covers that hole and also covers the, the area, the ridge between the LA appendage and the pulmonary vein. So it may make the second ablation more difficult. But if it is a recurrent procedure or if uh, the chances are that he will not stay in atrial fibrillation despite multiple lines, I would think a combined procedure is better. Okay. And uh, what is your current strategy uh, in this patient after LAAO? What, what is your anti-thrombotic strategy after implanting the occluder? So anticoagulant strategy, uh, if we are using an amplance or an amulet device, a single antiplatelet is enough. But if you're using a... a a uh, watchman device, the guidelines say warfarin, but we have started using NOAC in lower doses. Suppose it is dabigatran, we give 110 milligram twice a day. The problems come patients who have intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, when the neurosurgeons don't allow us to use uh, anticoagulants or antiplatelets, that is the major issue. And they need a device because they are in permanent atrial fibrillation. Now they had a hemorrhagic stroke. So we wait for some time and uh, generally give a device after 15 days. And most neurosurgeons allow us to use at least one antiplatelet after 15 days of uh, intracranial bleed. Okay. Dr. Yu, do you have any question or comment? Um, yeah, Dr. Singh, just want to check. So um, there are three years. Some some questions now being asked, you know, with especially with Watchman Flex being a uh, um, a much easier lower learning curve uh, procedure, and some of them are actually thinking of offering even in patients who are not high risk for anticoagulation. What do you think about it? So I would think that uh, as an interventionist, I love this procedure, but the guidelines don't uh, want more randomized trials. And one of the problems with the Watchman device was the pericardial effusions, uh, even on the late term. That easy implants and lower incidence of uh, pericardial effusion. But as I said, there are multiple trials going on, and we need to get the randomized uh, data. The protect and prevail were very old trials and compared it against warfarin. So I think we need some more data before we actually embark into low risk patients. Thank you. Okay. So uh, if there are no more questions uh, at the end, uh, I want to thank 
Professor Jin Li Ling for organizing this uh, APSC Cloud Forum focused on discussing atrial fibrillation therapy. Uh, and we also like to thank all the faculties from Singapore, Vietnam, Japan, India, and Taiwan. Uh, so I conclude this section. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Junidi, do you have yeah. some words? No, okay. I will thank no? you all for your contribution to our success on the section. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank we you. We'll see you all in the future. Okay, see, see you. you. See you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.